All right, hello there. I'm doing a bit of an experiment here. So I'm simultaneously recording myself talking on both my iPad and my computer. So one of the videos will show what I wrote down on my paper, and one of the videos will show all my calculator steps. I don't think I'm going to write down all these calculator steps because I want you to really get a feel for it, but I do want you to be able to look at what I did in case you get stuck and you can see where I clicked. So problem number one was this ball problem that we talked about as a group. So this one I can go through rather quickly. So we have these two balls and the first ball's height is given by this function. Second ball's height is given by another function. So after one second means t equals one. F of one we can compute as 14 and that means 14 feet. G of 1 is 15 plus 6 minus 16, which is 5 feet. So what this means is after one second, 14 feet is higher. So ball number 1 is higher after one second. But now we don't just want to know what's happening at one second. We want to use a graph to understand how these compare to each other all the time. So I'm going to open a new document here, and let's put in a graph page. So it's asking me for a function. Now it's asking it in terms of x. So I'll write the same formula, but instead of calling the variable x, I'll call the variable, sorry, instead of calling the variable t, I'll call the variable x. So I have 30x minus 16x squared. I'll try to do the clicking on the actual simulator here rather than my keyboard. And now I want to graph another one. So from menu, graph entry, function, I can graph another function. And while I'm up here and that cursor is blinking, if I just do up arrow, that shows me F1 and then down arrow back to F2, down again to 3. So all of your different formulas are in that same menu and you can click back and forth. So F2 is going to be 15 plus 6t, which we should call 6x, minus 16x squared. So we see two graphs, but it's hard to make sense of this. Now we want to change our window to get a better sense of what's going on. And when you pick your window, look at the formulas, think about what they measure, and at least make some reasonable guesses. You can always change. So if I go to menu, number four is window zoom, and the first entry, number one, is window settings. In this problem, x is standing for time. Time starts at zero. Very rarely would we have negative time. And these balls go up and down rather quickly. I can probably just look at what happens over the course of three seconds. Y is measuring the height. We'll start that at zero. Negative height doesn't really make sense. And if we look at these formulas, we notice that one of the heights starts at 15, right? We saw numbers like 14 and 5. We probably want to go a little bit taller than that. So let's choose 20. So you want to get a sense of what these things are measuring and make your minimum and maximum reflect a range of numbers that seems relevant to the problem. So there we go. In this picture, I see what's going on much better. I don't have any negatives there, and I don't have a lot of clutter. There's clearly the red graph that's doing something, and there's clearly the blue graph that's doing something. So I will copy this down, get a sense of what's going on here. So. When I draw these pictures, I want to make sure I understand what they're measuring. X is what the calculator calls it, but that's really time. Y is what the calculator calls it, but that's really height. My red graph here is what the calculator calls F2, but that was originally G. My blue graph here is what the calculator calls F1, but that was originally F. So I'm drawing a picture here to understand what was on my calculator screen. Because later on I might not have that screen, but this is a reminds me of what I saw. Now I want to find the <clears throat> now I want to find the intersection. So assuming you're already on your graph screen, go to menu, 
we're going to analyze the graph. And entry number four is intersection. It says lower bound with a question mark. And then it'll, yeah, so there's this vertical line. If you just slide back and forth without clicking on your little finger pad thing, that moves this vertical line. You want to move it to the left of the intersection you're finding. It's lower in the sense of make a lower X. Now click and it asks for an upper bound. So now slide to the, to the right of the point you're looking for. It creates this shaded zone and it will automatically find the intersection in that zone. So it finds it and it labels it. I'm going to put that on my graph here. And X is 0 0.625, Y is 12.5. So now, back on my sheet of paper, I want to write a sentence or two explaining this. These are in the same place. What does that mean? It means the balls are at the same height at the same time. If X is the same, it's the same time. If Y is the same, they're the same height. So what this is saying is at t equals 0 0.25 seconds, I'm emphasizing its time by putting in what the correct unit is, the balls are at the same height. And that height is 12.5 feet. So in my sentence, I'm emphasizing what time this occurs at, what the height is, and that something is the same. So now let's look at problem number two. This is about populations of cities. And I'm modeling in thousands of people. That's to keep the numbers from getting too big. And also with years starting at t equals 0 is 2,000. Again, to keep the numbers from getting too big. So on my calculator, I'm going to start a new document. Generally speaking, for each problem like this, it's probably easier to just start a new document. So I don't want to save that old one. Oops, I don't want to save that old one. So document, file, new document. Do I want to save unsaved? No. So let's do graphs. So I know eventually I'll be graphing these functions. So I might want to just jump right in even before I do the other things. So one of my functions is 800 times, you can click times here, it's also implied by just juxtaposition. 1.01 .01 raised to the x power. I have to change the variable to x. So this is f1. What we're calling a originally will be f1 on the calculator. And menu, graph entry, another function. f2 will be this one with an x. So that's 300 times 1.04 raised to the x power. Again, the variable here is called x, so we have to make some changes. So I'm just putting these in, and I haven't even changed my window yet. Let's do some computations, because part A here is asking us about the population in 2010. So that's saying t equals 10. We're starting the clock at 2,000 just to keep the numbers low. So I want to do some computations. I'm going to add a page. In blue, above document, it says plus page. So control and you hit that button. You can add another page to this document. I'll add a calculator. And it's interacting with the other page. So it knows the things that I've already put in. So if I go to the variable key above 9, it has stored some functions here. Right, The f on the left means it's stored as a function. f1 is stored. f1 is the same as a. So if I want to know what's the population after 10, I can just ask the calculator to compute f1 of 10 
and it comes out to 883.698. Now remember, this is a model where we're counting in thousands. So this actually means 883, 698 people. The population of the other city would be B of 10. That's already stored in my variable menu, right? The variables aren't just variables, they're also functions. It's anything you've given a name to somewhere in this document. I can plug in 10 here and I get 444.073. So that's 444,073 people. So in the year 2010, what we're seeing is that city A had a bigger population. But that might not last forever. Let's go back to our graphing page. And I want to change the windows to see what's going on. So what I can do, and there are different ways to change the windows. We can go to menu, window zoom, like we did before. But also you can click on these numbers. So here, this negative 10 means the smallest X on the graph is negative 10. If I click here, or maybe double click, you should be able to delete that and put in something else. Let's start the clock at zero. Generally, for these problems, you want to start things at zero. And now over here, it's saying the biggest x is 10. Well, x here is measuring time. I don't want to look over 10 years. Let's not even look at this over the course of maybe 100 years, from the year 2000 to the year 2100. And now here, negative 6.67 is the minimum y. That's minimum population. Let's just make that a zero. Generally speaking, making a minimum a zero is a good idea. Now, as for the maximum, we already computed those values and they were in the hundreds, right? We have hundreds of thousands of people. I might wanna go up to a million people here. So a million people in thousands would be y equals a thousand. So I click that and I can see my graphs, but I don't see where they're intersecting. You can notice the red graph is steeper than the blue graph. So it looks like if we could go a little bit higher, we would see them intersecting. So let's go higher. Let's take this maximum and change it to a bigger number. Maybe instead of a million, I need to look at 2 million. So that means 2,000 in terms of how I'm measuring this. And there I see my intersection. So what I want you to realize is you don't have to get those windows perfect on your first guess. Just come up with something plausible, and if you don't see your intersection but have a sense of where it's going to be, you can make some adjustments. So I'll draw my graph here. X is measuring time. Y is measuring the population. My red graph there was F2, which was B. My blue graph was F1, which was A. And now we're going to find that intersection from the graph, meant from the graph uh, window, from the page here with the graph. Go to Menu, Analyze, Intersection. Lower bound needs to be to the left, and then click, and then create that zone, and it'll find it automatically. And we get that this occurs at 33.51 comma 1117. So let's think about what this means. When these intersect, it means the time is the same and the population is the same. Right? Some of the time, right? At the beginning of the century, city A has the bigger population. After a certain point, they're the same. And then later, the red one's taller, so city B has a bigger population. So what we're seeing here is that they have the same population at t equals roughly 33. That would be the year 2033. 
For years, you can do some rounding because we don't talk about fractional years. So we could say something like the populations are, and if you want to be safe, you could say approximately equal in the year 2033. And maybe we should change this to a will be because it's in the future. Very often with population models, we come up with a function so we can project into what we think will happen in the future. Uh, and we could say in that year, both populations will be approximately, well, our value here is 1117. But remember, that's measuring in thousands. So we're really looking at 1,117,000 people. All right. Let's, oh, I'm getting all these notifications. Let's do one more. So here was this supply and demand one. And I had some typos here. This should have been P. And you can think of this as S of P. This is D of P. I'm not writing it in function notation, but it is a function. I'm going to start a new document here. New document. Don't want to save that. I'm going to start this one with a calculator. So what you can do is if you have some formulas that you know you'll need, you can teach those functions to the calculator, but make sure you write them as functions. So what I can do is I can write S parenthesis P, close parenthesis, and then I want to give a definition of this. Next to the nine in blue, you'll see colon equals. So control and hit that key. Colon equals is your way of teaching a definition to the calculator. So we can now type in 40p. We can call this variable p as long as we're consistent. Hit enter, and it has learned that formula. Similarly, I can teach it what d of p is. d of p colon equals 600 plus 1,000 over p. Uh, you can certainly do 1,000 and then the division. Uh, if you want to actually make it look like a fraction, this key to the left of the 9 creates all kinds of things, including a generic fraction. And then you can just type in what you want to be at the top of that fraction, 1,000. And then go down. What do I want to be on the bottom of that fraction, p? Hit enter. It has learned that. So... My first thing here is, if the price is $10 per widget, what's the supply and what's the demand? So these functions have been taught to the calculator. If I go to the variables menu, there they are. So S of 10, it does 400. So S of 10 is 400. From the variables menu, here's D. D of 10 is 700. So what this means, and I'm going to write this out, I'm not saying you would have to, but this is saying if the price is $10 per widget, right, that's, we're assuming that's sort of a low price, <clears throat> producers will want to produce. 400,000 widgets. These functions are measuring in thousands again. While consumers will want to buy 700,000 widgets. So here, the demand would be greater than the supply. At a fairly low price, some people might be willing to sell it, but not a lot but a lot of people would be willing to buy it. 
So theoretically, there would be 300,000 buyers who are disappointed because there's not enough widgets to go around. So what we would notice is many buyers or consumers would be disappointed. Okay, so I did not budget my time well. I have a meeting starting in five minutes. So I will resume these videos in just a little bit.